So without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Larry Miller, who will be our presenter. Uh, Larry currently is serving as our Interim Vice President for Learning and Workforce Development. Uh, prior to that, he was actually involved with the college. He had come here and was serving in, in our um, institutional research area. But Larry comes with a very long list of uh, credentials and experience. Um, and I think you will see that come through as you hear him today. But I wanted to share with you, he previously has been the Dean of the School of Education, Charter Schools and um, Dual Enrollment at Florida Southwestern State College. Um, he is a research affiliate uh, currently at the University of Washington Center on Reinventing Public Education. Uh, and Larry's education, finance, and policy research has been featured on NPR, to name a few, uh, as well as editorials that have appeared in USA Today and other publications. Uh, Larry holds a PhD in public administration from the Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs at Syracuse and specializes in public finance and budgeting and social policy. So you can see that uh, he has a great depth and breadth that he brings to the college um, and to our work in helping students succeed. Um, and so without further ado, Larry, I'm going to turn it over to you. Well, thank you for that introduction, Anne. It's a pleasure to be here today and see all of you and uh, just chat about vaccines and everyone getting a chance to protect ourselves. I'm looking forward to that day. Um, and in the meantime, thanks for joining me on Zoom. So um, with that background, I'm really excited about today's topic and discussion because as you can see by my background, I'm interested really in the intersection of finance and education, right? So what can we do to remove barriers to help more of our students succeed and in particular financial barriers? So that's what I'm gonna talk about today. So I'm gonna to try to keep the stats as light as I can uh, and drive home some key points. I'll start out with just some statistics about the college for those who don't know. Um, most recently, you'll see our full year enrollment. It's about 14.4 uh, thousand uh, credit seeking students. We had non credit seeking students of about 8,000. Um, so in total, you know, you're looking at over 22,000 uh, students that we're serving annually. Our average student age is 24. Uh, about six out of every 10 students is part time and six out of 10 is female. And those uh, trends are pretty consistent nationally. And the average age here is getting younger. And that's also a trend that's happening nationally. One of the reasons why is we do have a growing dual enrollment population. And uh, currently we are serving this semester 1700 plus dual enrollment students, which are high school students taking college courses concurrently. Um, we serve uh, 23 international students representing 15 di different countries, including Turkey. There's four students here from Turkey that I'm working with currently. And um, about 1,000 uh, students came directly from uh, the Greenville County Schools this fall. We also know we've got three charter schools on our campus as well. And one thing you should also be aware of is we transfer um, about 200 students a year each to Clemson, USC Upstate, and USC Main Campus. I will not say which of those three is the top transfer destination, just to keep the peace. <laughs> um, so at Greenville Tech, uh, just our financial aid facts at a glance, about almost seven out of every 10 students get some kind of financial aid or support, uh, which is uh, consistent with technical community colleges. We generally serve a more um, you know, economically uh, disadvantaged student population. 23% uh, are first time in their family to enroll in college. And last year we gave away about $51 million um, in aid. I should also add that one in four of our students is a parent themselves. So one in four of our students has children. I wanna talk about enrollment trends in the COVID era. I'm not sure how many on this call have really been paying attention to this, but um, nationally in the community college sector, we saw a dramatic decline in enrollment for the first time in a long time. Um, US community and technical colleges nationally saw enrollment drop by 9%. Um, 
Here within our state, we saw and witnessed an 8% drop across the system. Uh, and then here at Greenville Tech, we were down in fall enrollment by 6.9%. So uh, I share that with you to say that, you know, nationally, the numbers do not look good. And I'm going to talk in a minute here about who those students are that we're missing. We have some um, important data to share with you that's some of it's fresh off the press. Uh, but, you know, we're doing our part here. And while our enrollment was down nearly 7%, we're actually beating those other trends. And I take that as, as a little bit of a good sign, uh, a little bit of a silver lining. So again, um, this is one of the figures I wanted to share with you. So when we look at Pell eligible students, these are students whose uh, families uh, do not make enough, make, their income levels are low enough that they qualify for the Pell uh, grant. Um, and so this is an indicator for those who are familiar with like uh, K-12 education. This is equivalent to like a free reduced price lunch category. Uh, so these are our students um, who we knew, know are um, coming from economically disadvantaged families. I'm getting some feedback. I don't know if everyone's getting that. Um, if, you're, if you could just mute your system, that'd be helpful. Um, so if you look up here, what I want to show you is that, um, so Pell eligibility in the spring of 2020, you see we had headcount who were, who were yes, affirmative to being el eligible, 3,600 students. This spring, we only saw 3,000 of those students. So we had a 17% drop year over year. For students who were not Pell eligible, we saw 60 almost 6,300 in the spring of 2020. This spring, we saw 5,830, so we saw a drop of 7% year over year. So the key takeaway from this chart is that Pell eligible students were nearly two and a half times less likely to enroll this spring compared with last spring. And that means due to COVID, we're missing 600 Pell eligible students this spring. So what that just tells us is that our high risk uh, student population, our most vulnerable students are the ones that are bearing the brunt of, uh, of the pandemic in some ways. And, you know, when we rack our brains to think about why, I think that, that the takeaways I have is that our students who are Pell eligible are most likely to be impacted by COVID. They're most likely to work in the service industries where they're most likely to contract the disease. They live in tighter living quarters, so they're more likely to spread that to family members. Um, and uh, they're also more likely to be impacted by layoffs and uh, changes in the local economy. And then they have to go to work to help their family meet their financial obligations. And so uh, it makes sense in that, you know, in that context to, to present this data, but obviously it's our goal to help those students get back on track with their education and their degree path. So that's what I'm gonna to talk to you about today. I wanna dig into and give you a little bit more background about how we think about our students who are at risk. Um, and we partnered with the Hope Center. The Hope Center is a national center that studies um, what they call real college, right? So what's happening with our students? Um, how many of our students are experiencing basic needs and security? Like, you know, know where their next meal is gonna come from, know where they're going to sleep that night. Th those are the basic needs we're talking about. And Dr. Sarah Goldrick Robb has been a leader in this space for over a decade. She started her work at the University of Wisconsin. She's been published widely. And then she relocated actually to uh, Temple University and the School of Medicine is where uh, the Hope Center is based. And we conducted actually two surveys with them. The first one when I became, when I accepted the position to be the uh, Director of Institutional Research here at Greenville Tech, which by the way, I was, uh, I was a trailing spouse at that point. We came here because my wife is, uh, was offered the position to direct the NICU at St. Francis Eastside. So I quit my deanship down in Florida and we came up here as a family to support Sue. And uh, luckily Greenville Tech was kind enough to give me a position and, uh, and I appreciate it very much. 
Um, so the Hope Center, we, we brought them in right away, uh, did our first sur survey. We had 1,400 students respond. We learned a lot from that survey. Then the Hope Center reached out to us when the pandemic struck and said, hey, would you like to jump on and do an another survey and see how your students are faring during the pandemic? We said, absolutely. And so here are some of the results from that second survey. So um, nationally, 38,600 students and 54 institutions across 26 states participated. Uh, we have had 10,300 students who were invited to participate. These were all credit bearing students. We did not invite non-credit students. Um, and we had a response rate of about 8.4%, um, nearly 900 students participated. That's a pretty good response rate for our institution. Our first survey had a response rate of almost 15, I think it was 14.6%. So we've gotten some, some good responses. And here's what we found. So when it comes to food insecurity during the pandemic, at Greenville Tech, you can see up there that about 38% of our students experienced uh, food insecurity over the past 30 days. Compared to our peers, we actually fall below our peer levels and the overall survey, which were at 44 and 42% respectively. In terms of housing insecurity, 31% of our students indicated that they did have housing insecurity, like not enough money to pay the rent or potentially utilities and other expenses. And we had 9% of our students experiencing some form of homelessness uh, that might include couch surfing or living in their car, uh, which is a, obviously a large number. That's nearly one in 10. So in aggregate, we had 52% of our students uh, report some kind of basic needs insecurity during the pandemic. Uh, so that's obviously more than half. And while we were interested to see whether our student population was um, had higher needs or lower needs than the rest of the technical college system, it was interesting that was a, deba a debate amongst many of my peers. And many of my peers kind of, you know, they said, oh, no way, Greenville, the reputation is we're a rich city in this state and our students don't have these needs. But the takeaway was that while we're doing a little bit better than our peer institutions, it's not much, right? So we're looking at 52% here. Uh, our peers are at 56%. So we're kind of all in the same boat in terms of uh, the student population we serve and their level of basic needs that are not being met. So I'm going to dig into the survey results a little bit more deeper. So um, here you can see um, in terms of the types of basic needs in security, um, we wanted to see where our students applying for financial supports. And what you see here is that 34% of our students ask for help, but at our peer institutions, 40% of students ask for help. That was alarming to us because we know that there is a lot of help out there for our students. Some of that help comes from us, right? So we house uh, a caring corner, right? And we have really worked hard to fill up that care, caring corner with food, uh, donations, um, personal sundries. In fact, um, our president even, you know, made a donation in uh, the cabinet's name, to, you know, to stock those shelves further. We all did that over the holidays. So the, the center is bursting with, with goods for our students, but our students, it just seems, are a little bit less likely than students at peer institutions to ask for help. And then as a result, they're also less likely to receive financial support. So you can see that in the takeaway box. So they're 15% less likely to ask for help and then 8% less likely to receive financial support. So I do want to mention we do have a financial literacy center um, and we have also recently received a federal Title III grant. And we have made um, in some of those investments we've made uh, the director of our food pantry uh, a full-time position, and that's Rick Grant. Some of you may know him. Um, and so we're trying to extend hours there. We're actually trying to get the food pantry on wheels during COVID to try to take donations to students' homes. Um, you know, anything we can do to lessen the burden uh, that we're seeing here in our data uh, on our students. So we also looked at, you know, uh, the impact in terms of employment. We heard that one third of our students reported either losing a job 
due to the pandemic or having their hours or their pay reduced. Um, students reported having anxiety and uh, challenge. Um, their ability to concentrate was challenged. Um, they had less time for school. They were caring more for family. Um, Greenville Tech students in, a, in a, another silver lining in this data, they were 30% less likely to report laptop or internet access issues. I think that's in part because our OIT department assembled over 150 uh, laptops. They acquired them quickly and we established a loaner program for students who needed uh, that kind of support. Um, and so we actually distributed all of those laptops uh, immediately to students who needed them. I want to share just some quotes here. Um, these are real Greenville Tech um, student quotes from 2020. Um, and I think, I mean, you can read these on your own. I'm not going to read them all, but I do want to draw your attention to the one in the bottom left corner, because I think that one kind of represents what we're seeing in some of the data. I've been doing this on my own since I was 16. I don't want to ask, but I'm out of options. I am doing this all on my own with no financial help from anyone. Is there any way you can help me? I promise you will not regret it. And I think that's the thing, the biggest challenge we have to overcome is encouraging our students to know that they can ask for help. And I'm going to talk about how we can put systems in place to make that easier in a minute. But before I get to that, I do want to share what happened this spring with you. I've got some data. So we were looking at this spring. Um, we had 985 returning students who had not registered for spring classes when we came back from winter break on that January 6th, I believe was the date. So we looked at that data and we ran a quick analysis to see um, how many of those students had an outstanding balance. Now, one thing you guys should know is that for two semesters, we um, stopped purging students for unpaid balances because of the pandemic. And it's a best practice to run an institution by not allowing students to register until all their balances from prior semesters have been paid. But we also recognized, you know, we were in a crisis and, and we needed to help our students. So we did that. We reinstituted our purge practice this spring, and we found that 972 of the 985 returning students had an unpaid balance that was preventing them from registering. So that was 97.8%. It was literally almost a one-to-one -one match, which just was shocking to us. And I remember bringing this data to a cabinet meeting, and that's where Ann and I really just grabbed the ball and ran with it. So I went running over to student financial aid um, and I, I kind of suggested to the team, look, we have workforce uh, scholarship funds and we get about a million dollars from the state annually. We had reserved about 400,000, maybe 360,000 for the summer cohort. And mind you, our students go to school year round. They are mostly part-time students. They need to go over the summer to stay on track to hit their uh, degree timelines and, and targets. And so, um, so we're looking at this data and we're saying, what if we took our summer um, scholarship dollars and used them this spring? Because the need was so acute and so um, obvious. And so we, we, uh, we did that. We identified 290 students who had a GPA of 2.0 or higher. They had a current uh, FAFSA on file um, and they had an outstanding balance of $3,000 or less. So we were able to, within 48 hours, award, and thanks to our student financial aid staff, they worked literally until midnight, two days in a row. They awarded over uh, about $310,000 when all was said and done to 290 students and made sure they all had an email in their inbox and a text message telling them about the award so that they would be able to register. So that was... Um, a really great effort by our team. At the same time, we had the foundation <laughs> uh, make a call out to our community. And I just have to say that I was just, I, I still am overwhelmed by the support. And I just want to thank everyone uh, in the foundation office and anyone on this call who helped us. Um, this just is a, an outpouring of tremendous support. We had $90,000 come in in just five days to help us. 
Um, by the way, I do want to back up for one sec. One question I got that was interesting was someone said, how much would it cost? You remember this, Anne. Someone said, how much would it cost to buy all 985 students out? The answer, by the way, was 1.3 million. Uh, by the time we were done with this effort here, we'd gotten that number down. I think by the time Anne was done, we got the number down to about 750,000 was left on the, on the balance. So we marshaled a lot of resources internally. But um, in any case, um, so the foundation raised the 90,000 in just five days. And that was fantastic because we were able to help an additional 52 students, you'll see here, eventually we ended up raising almost $110,000 with emergency uh, assistance funds. As a result of that, 33% of those students who received those funds were still able to enroll in spring classes um, this semester. And I do want to share with you, it's it's kind of an interesting parallel in this in the data. If I go back to this report, the same thing happened. So one third of these students of the 290 also registered for, for spring. So two different sets of students, but the same outcome. We do have flex start courses that are starting in uh, the spring uh, on February 8th. And we expect uh, hopefully about another 15% of those students to register for those uh, flex start courses. So we expect to see this number get up to closer to 50% or one in every two students that we helped still enroll in spring classes. And then many of the others we expect to see again in the summer. So uh, this is really an excellent um, outcome for everyone's efforts. I wanna talk about just a couple students. Um, I, I'm gonna talk about Mary here in a second, but I also just wanna share with you when these dollars, I'm just gonna go back to these dollars for a second. I have the Dean of the business school call me and say, I've got a student who's gonna be purged. They need a $50 fee and they'll have the money to pay for their courses in a week. Can we get emergency assistance of $50 to keep a student who's in their third semester of classes, you know, getting close to earning their degree, more than halfway there. Uh, I had another student who could pay for two of their credits in a three credit course, but they needed $200 to pay for the third credit hour. And then they were gonna earn a certificate in computer uh, science. So those are the kinds of $200 there, $50 in the other case, kept those students on track to complete their degrees and enter our workforce. And so Anne and her team, those are two examples of, of students I was involved in directly that we funded. Um, but we also helped Mary here. So Mary is a future paramedic. Um, she'll actually be completing her degree on this coming year in 2022. And she thought that basically because of finances, her degree was out of reach. <clears throat> the foundation got involved and gave her a scholarship. And so she was able to enroll, but when she went to enroll, she learned that she didn't meet our math requirement. So she ended up taking a special tutorial program online over four days, reassessed on math, blew the exam results out of the water, is now full-time enrolled in our program. And like I said, she'll be a paramedic student. Uh, and we helped her get to become a paramedic at least a year, if not more, uh, quicker than she would have been uh, had we not helped her out. So thank you for your support for Mary and for students like her. I'm gonna pause here for a second because I haven't had any questions and I'm certainly open to them as we go through this uh, data. Let me just check the chat box. I don't know if Jackie or Lauren have anything that they are seeing in the chat they want to raise. I didn't see anything in the chat yet, but okay. you're welcome Very good. to add any questions or um, unmute yeah. yourself as well. Okay. All right, well, I will jump into lessons learned and then uh, we can certainly uh, pivot to questions after that. Um, let's see, okay. So I think one of the lessons just from this pandemic, pre-pandemic, in the pandemic, and I'm sure post-pandemic is that our students that we serve are always going to have financial needs. They're gonna have emergency needs that we need to support. And so the lesson from that is we've gotta establish some funds that are easy to spend 
when we find a student that has these needs, they're doing all the right things in their coursework, and we have a tremendous amount of data about our students. We know who's doing well academically. We know who's putting in the sweat equity. They've got skin in the game. And unfortunately, a lot of times when we get to that student as administrators, as faculty and staff, we don't necessarily have the resources at hand to help that student right on the spot when they need it. And so we've got to get more of a just-in-time delivery system of emergency cash assistance to students. We have to let them know that it's available so that they can continue to progress towards their degree. Even just a, like I said before, a $50 balance in the example I talked about could have derailed a student who is about to earn their certificate, which is a completion uh, for, for the student and our program. And that could change the trajectory of their earnings, right, and their whole career. And in fact, uh, maybe even for their whole family and their economic well being. So uh, that's the kind of um, lessons we've learned from this. We also learned that our deans, our department heads, um, and our faculty, they really just know a tremendous amount about our students. We asked them to comb through that list of students. If you look back at that data I talked about, we had about 900 students. We helped about 350. The remainder that we didn't help, we wanted to comb through all their files. And we did that through every school and every dean here to find students that we could still help. And what we learned from that exercise is there were only a handful that we could help, that we felt were um, doing all the right things in the program, had the, the grades, had put in the effort, and needed financial emergency financial assistance. So we were able to get those students the help that they needed. So I, I just want to say that all that knowledge is um, was put to use, and also we're not just giving this money out willy-nilly, right? We're giving it to the students who, who have um, demonstrated a commitment and, if you would say, earned it. I also want to share that some of our funds are easier to award than others. So that scholarship example I gave you, our WPG scholarship funds, within 48 hours, we were able to award that on a formulaic basis. Uh, oftentimes, when we have restricted funds in the foundation, we have to look at the requirements of that fund and then match the funds restrictions to the student who is eligible. And that involves literally four divisions here at the college. And so Ann and I were trying to, you know, every day, okay, you're doing this, I'm doing that. We worked really well together, but it was a, um, it was a, a very manual process. So one of the lessons we learned is um, we quickly started coding all of our funds and having better dashboards internally. So we're getting better at giving away money even faster. And that's really great. But the other thing is we just need in each of our schools an emergency aid fund that a dean can allocate at their discretion. That way we've lifted all the restrictions. And in fact, the reason I would recommend this is because we already have a tool. We have this thing called Civitas. I don't know if you have heard of it, but it's our predictive analytics platform and it's super advanced. And one of the tools inside that platform is um, we have impact studies. We essentially have the power to do um, causal inference studies of things we interventions that we do on behalf of students so after with a fund like the one i'm advocating for in point five what we can do after the fact is assess our allocations to find out how much of an impact we had on student success and so we do those studies currently um, in fact we're doing that right now for Ann, and that'll be the subject of another Lunch and Learn. We've been uh, studying the emergency cash assistance impacts, and so at some point we'll come back with that analysis and data. Um, but it's kind of a different way of thinking about it, right? It's like we're lifting the restrictions now, leveraging the knowledge that we have within the school to give the money to the students who need and deserve it immediately, and then let's study the impact afterward and learn lessons from it and then give that money away better uh, going forward. So that's one thing. And I think that's also an investment in our staff and in our people. One of the things we do here at the college is we use Civitas to predict students who have a low or very low likelihood to persist. And we have a retention response effort where our teams are reaching out to students from that list and saying, hey, what's going on? I'm calling to check in on you. I'm emailing you. I'm texting you. I'm calling. What's up? 
And we then look at their data. We see if they're not logging into our learning management system. We try to troubleshoot things for them. And we try to start a conversation where we can help them um, overcome whatever barriers they're facing. That effort has already increased our persistence rate by two percentage points. So over 200 students returned last year to the college that wouldn't have had we not been doing all of our retention response efforts. Um, but one of the challenges we sometimes face is we run down a student who is um, struggling to persist and the barrier is financial. If we have emergency aid funds to help that student, then we can connect them and meet their need on the spot. And that'll just help us with those efforts and expand them even more. And I'll share with you guys that we learned this model from the University of South Florida. They're a Civitas client. We went down there for a visit. You guys can look at their data. They went from a 67% uh, persistence rate to 91% using this model, okay? We've gotten up to 78% already. So we're doing good things with it as well. Um, and that's into the pandemic. I, I would say the last lesson that we learned is that um, there are some colleges we're looking at around the country. Lorraine Community College is one. Um, they started a, an emergency loan program. And so that's something that I'd really like to get funded here at Greenville Tech. And with the idea being that a student can apply for emergency loan, they will pay us back, uh, and then we can reloan those dollars again. It's my understanding that that model has a 94% repayment rate, which is incredible. It's been around since the late 80s. Um, and so I just want to share with you guys that I'm not only the data guy behind all this and the one digging into the weeds on all of this stuff, but I also believe in it. So my wife and I, that's where we're putting our money is in point six. Um, so I'll be working with Anne to make uh, a donation to uh, start that emergency loan program. Uh, but I think five and six, whatever um, you know, you're interested in, that's, that's where we really need the support of the community. So with that, I wanna turn it over to Anne to just talk about our emergency cash assistance program over the course of the whole year. Uh, and then I'll be back, I'll stay online and we can answer any questions you have. So thank you. Thank you, Larry. Um, and I will say uh, it has been a pleasure. There is a good deal of work that the foundation uh, has been doing that the predictive analytics that Civitas brings uh, will also help. And the most interesting and greatest development is uh, what Larry mentioned is this full-time position that the college now has that will be focused um, in these areas and arenas. And so while the foundation is very good at talking to all of you about needs and you are all are most gracious and are making donations, we really want the college side, the, the faculty, the deans, those that are closest to the data and the knowledge of the student uh, to be the ones that are actually making the awards. Um, and again, that's where we're going to move the needle. So we're really looking forward to many more possibilities in partnership with the college. Uh, but you can see last year, um, the foundation pretty much single-handedly uh, working with us. Uh, many of you know we have endowed scholarship funds and we were able to award over $450,000 to over 500 students. Uh, that's incredible. Um, I've not been here but four years, but I believe that was probably a record and who would have thought that in 2020. Um, and so we were just extremely excited that we were able to do that. The downside of that, uh, lower quadrant there is that we were only able to help 40% of the qualified applicants. So in other words, that meant there was another 500 students, right, that qualified, but we didn't have enough funds. So again, back to how Larry started out with the presentation, we know that our student body uh, has barriers and challenges that many others don't face. We'd like to get to the point at the foundation where 100%, whoever applies and is qualified will be able to assist um, because most of our students are part-time. Uh, and so that, that takes them out of being able to get some of the federal or state money sometimes. Um, and then in the upper quadrant, left quadrant, you see the emergency uh, aid to 165 students. This is aid 
such as utility bills, the car broke down, a medical bill, um, a bus pass, you name it. Um, we've been able to, to help that many students and we have a, a focus on that this year in terms of growing that fund. So working in concert uh, with Larry and his team and Dr. Mateel Knowles and student services and her team, we're confident that we're going to be able to help even more. But last year, uh, just a record year uh, for the foundation with over half a million dollars in direct assistance to students. That's a pretty good, that's a pretty good thing. So as I transition, we thought it might be nice for you to hear from one of our students, one of our recipients of emergency assistance. And so Jackie's going to load this video up for you and you'll hear directly from Christina Cole, who is a marketing student. Um, unfortunately, she was laid off uh, in 2020, um, but now she has found a position. She's working full time as a nurse assistant, which is uh, a very important role right now, as most of you can appreciate. Uh, but she uh, has a bit of a story to tell in terms of what the emergency assistance was able to do for her. All the, the coronavirus, all the negativity, all the negativity, all the negative stuff in the world going on right now. You guys are just the light and you make it possible and you give us hope, you give me hope. So I'm, my, I'm a marketing major and my goal is to finish this journey and actually be part of this foundation and help other students like you guys have helped me. And I just wanted to make a statement and tell you how grateful I am. And I, I please, I, um, I will, I'm sorry, I'll, I really want to thank each and every one of you individually because again, without this, it wouldn't be possible and you are important and you make me feel like I am important and you make me feel like this is possible, that I can graduate, that I can be successful and that anything is possible with that support and I just really, really appreciate it. Thank you again. We'll open it up. Any other comments or questions from anyone? Larry, I have a, a question for you. Um, this is Steve Hall. So on the on the loans, what kind of percent interest rate does the school ask or charge? Yeah, Steve, that's a great question. I, I just want to share with you that I don't have any other details except what I heard about what Lorraine did. And the minute I heard the model, literally this was two days ago, I'm prepping for this session and I'm talking to one of our deans, um, Cindy Davis. Some of you may know her. And she said, well, I was at this session at, you know, where I visited Lorraine and here's what they're doing. And I'm like, send me a picture of that slide. And I, that's what I wanna invest in. So we're literally gonna set it up now. So anyone who wants to come on board with me, uh, we'll figure out those details. I'll learn more what Lorraine did um, and try to replicate their model and maybe others. But, um, you know, and if you have advice there, Steve, I don't know if finance is your area, I'd be happy to hear more. Um, I just try to keep more cash than I'd spend it. <laughs> That's the only <laughs> advice that I give. <laughs> Zero percent sounds great, but I know Sam Irwin would object as a banker. So. Yeah. Well, and the other, <laughs> no the way. other piece of this is um, uh, the, the foundation currently does loans. Um, those loans are actually guaranteed in a sense. So there's zero interest, but um, the loans are actually financial aid that we know is coming to a student. Uh, and then that information is provided to the business office and they know to pay the foundation before the rest of the financial aid is placed in the student's account. So we do have that mechanism. Um, and oftentimes that happens. <clears throat> there can be a delay uh, in terms of some of this federal federal state money. So uh, that's, that's a mechanism that's already in place. And if I'm not mistaken, Larry Lorraine Community College is also one of the community colleges that we looked at Mm -hmm. for the African-American Male Scholars Initiative. Um, I believe that Dr. Watt and some others actually visited 
uh, yeah. Lorraine Community College. And that program, uh, some of the folks on the line are familiar with, and we have a, another Lunch and Learn coming up next week, February 4th, on that subject. We actually uh, took from, again, Lorraine was doing a version of it, um, and it is a focus on the success, persistence, and retention for African-American Black males. So, um, African-American males, excuse me. So, um, it sounds like Lorraine's kind of on the cutting edge of a lot of things. Yeah, Cindy was a part of, uh, Dean Davis was a part of that uh, team that visited. So that's, uh, yeah, that's where all those ideas are coming from. Other questions, comments, or uh, Larry, anything you'd like to, to say in summation? Um, you guys are much easier on me than the students were. I hosted a town hall on Tuesday night. Woof. They really grilled me. <laughs> so, um, no, I just, uh, nice to meet you all. Thanks for joining us. Sorry we couldn't provide lunch with the learning session. I hope you had some <laughs> good takeaways. I, I guess, I just hope you can see that we're really um, using data to drive decisions here at the college and really um, put our money to the best use we can to help the most students. Um, and, and I hope if that's the one takeaway you have from this talk, that's it. And the second one is that if you can help more of our students um, or your friends can, um, we can use it and our students can use it and they'll benefit from it. So thank you. Thank you, Larry. I see Melissa's place. She says, you're amazing. Um, Melissa, <laughs> I didn't know you were on here. She must be joining on the phone uh, with Bank of America, another great supporter and friend of the Technical College and the Foundation. Thank you for that. Thanks. Melissa. All right, everybody. Well, we'll give you a chance to maybe grab a little lunch, but please uh, let us know any other comments or questions you have. Uh, you know how to reach us. And thank you so much, Larry, for being with us today and providing such a great uh, view and picture so that we can have a better understanding of the needs of our students. Thanks so much. My pleasure. Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you.